Uh, first question to the entire panel. I've long been concerned that our visa issuance and oversight processes, particularly uh, the student visa, is uh, inac inadequate. In fact, I've introduced legislation that will help ensure that terrorists do not use our student visa process as a backdoor into our country. We know the terrorists involved in both the 1993 and the 2001 World Trade Center attacks were in the U U.S. because they violated the terms of their student visas. Do you believe the question, do you believe that terrorists are still able to explore our student uh, visa system to gain entry into the United States, to radicalize American citizens, and or engage in uh, terrorist attacks for the entire panel? This is really a comment rather than a complete answer to your question. I, in the 2009 Manchester plot in the United Kingdom, uh, the people involved all were on student visas which they overstayed. So certainly this is an idea that is percolating with uh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, because these guys were all from that area. Um, I mean, on the, the counter argument would be, we want to encourage people from Muslim countries to come to this country to study, and it's already pretty difficult for, for them to get in. We don't want to penalize, you know, the 99% of the people who are coming legitimately. Uh, already, you know, getting a visa in a country like Pakistan is pretty problematic, uh, student or otherwise. And so we have to balance those two things. Uh, because there are two different goods uh, at, at stake here. I, I would reinforce with Peter's point in the last regard is certainly a more effective system, but it would have to be very well resourced for it to work more nimbly than it does. What we're doing overseas with consul officials is putting lots of requirements on without much capacity, creating backlogs and challenges that keep the legitimate good people we want in process. So, so we have to really think about when we weigh that requirement, how do we make sure we adequately manage it? We should be doing it very competently. But uh, the deep concern is that uh, at the end of the day, our most powerful tool has been for the overwhelming uh, 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 I think success of the American experience is having people experience it uh, to get here and be at conferences and schools in our classroom. The overwhelming majority then go back home and bring those values with them. If we basically uh, start to, to, to uh, close that down, it's all so difficult giving the media that's out there for people to validate the greatness of this country if they haven't experienced it. So it's, it's a real difficult tension, I think, that's at work uh, here. At the end of the day, the, the threat does continue to, to uh, I think the key is not overselling what these tools can do. The diversification will happen. The recruitment is going to populations that are within our own uh, society. So we, we have to, I think, see it through that a more encompassing lens. Well, it's a very pertinent question, particularly given the profile in The New Yorker. Uh, this, this week of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who first, the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks, who first came to the United States as a student. Uh, one of the cases we identified last year, of course, involved a student, although not a student in the United States, Umar Farouk Abdelmutalab. It has been, as Mr. Bergen said, uh, more common, and I think the British authorities see it as a, as a very serious problem in the United Kingdom. My point would be that, unfortunately, over the years, trends in terrorism that we've seen elsewhere inevitably come to the United States, even if they haven't manifested themselves in any significant way here yet. But the case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, of course, is an indicator that people who come to the United States draw their own conclusions as well from their student experiences. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, for the entire panel again. Uh, terrorist organizations have become adept at using the internet to recruit, inspire, and motivate individuals in the United States to carry out attacks on their behalf. What are your thoughts on how to combat the use of internet and other technologies by terrorist organizations that seek to inspire and encourage terrorist attacks in our country by those who are already here? You know, I think there's a huge First Amendment problem and there's a huge technology problem, which neither of which I think are very superable. Um, the technology is always going to be better than what the government can do. Um, and so trying to close these kinds of things down, of course, is the intelligence gathering that you can gather from these internet sites, which is useful. Um, I, you know, while it might be desirable to try and do something about this, I think it, in practice it would be very hard. I've, I've testified in this room before, Congresswoman Harmon's subcommittee on this, on this issue, and I think it's one of the biggest problems we face and in the sense that the Internet's become this vast vacuum that unfortunately the purveyors and communicators of hatred and intolerance have taken advantage of, not least, I think, to peddle 
often base, completely untruthful conspiracy theories that gain incredible traction. I see this as a problem that we've talked about in essence for nine years since 9-11, but there really hasn't emerged any strategy or any approach to how to deal with it. Under Under Secretary Glassman and the previous administration, I think there was progress being made in the State Department on this because he was someone who understood that you have to knit together the various communications arm of the United States. But I think that was sort of a, a, brief, uh, a brief flurry of activity and prioritization that unfortunately has fallen by the wayside. Another thing I'd add is I, I think it's clear that we need the counter messages and we talked, uh, uh, Dr. Hoffman mentioned it earlier here that this AID and, uh, and the uh, focus uh, on our public communications abroad is primarily still traditional media and we had to get to different media. But one message that I try to convey again in my domestic audience as well overseas is this is a resilient country and we will not be cowed by those who want to threaten us. We bounce back better and stronger when hit and, and try, but we will bounce back better and stronger. We have to have messages that don't feed the sense that this, these acts of terror will give these folks great glory and, uh, and opportunity.